Thanks a lot for having me here. Today, I'm going to talk about neural rendering. Because rendering is such a massive topic, I'll start with some clarifications. So as far as this lecture goes, rendering can be both a forward process and an inverse process. The forward rendering uh, computes an image from some 3D scene parameters, such as the shape of, uh, the shape of object, the color of object, the surface uh, material, and the, the light source, etc. Forward rendering has been one of the major focus of computer graphics for many years. The opposite of this problem is the inverse rendering. Um, it studies the problem that given some images, we are trying to work out what are the 3D things that was used to produce this imaging. And the inverse rendering is closely related to computer vision uh, with applications such as 3D reconstruction and uh, uh, motion capture, et cetera. And forward rendering and the inverse rendering are intrinsically related because the high level representation of a vision system should look like the representation using computer graphics. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about um, how machine learning can be used to improve the solution to both of these two problems. But before we dive into uh, neural networks, let's first take a very quick tour to the conventional method. This is a sort of a toy example of ray tracing, which is a widely used forward rendering technique. Imagine you are inside of a cave. The red bar is a light source, um, and the grid is in the image plane. Uh, ray tracing works by shooting rays from an imaginary eye to every pixel in the grid, in the pixel, uh, in the image grid. And uh, it tries to compute the color of the object and the ray that you can see through the ray. In this case, the ray directly hits the light source. So we're using the color of the light source to color the pixel. However, more often than not, the ray will hit some object surface before it bounces into the light source. In this case, we need to calculate the color of the surface. The color of the surface can be computed as an integral of the instance radiance. However, this is very difficult to do in an um, analytic way. So what people normally do is to use multicolor sampling which generate a random rays within the integral domain and then compute the average of its rays as the approximation of the integral. We can also change the uh, sampling function to approximate surface material. This is how we can make the surface look more glossy or rough. Um, most of the time, a ray needs multiple bounds before it hits the light source. And this soon develops into a recursive problem, which is very expensive to do. So there are many advanced ray tracing techniques that have been invented to deal with this problem, which I'm, going, I'm, not, I'm not going to talk here. But the general consensus is ray tracing with multicolor sampling is very expensive because of the very high estimate of variance and the low convergence rate. For a complex thing like this, you need hundreds of millions or maybe billions of ray to render. So the question we ask is whether machine learning can be used to speed up this process. And the answer, as we will see later in the lecture, is yes. But before we dive into the answer, let's quickly switch to the inverse problem for a moment. So this is a classical stereo from, uh, shape from stereo problem, where you have two images of the same object, and you're trying to work on the 3D shape of the object. You do this by first finding the similar features across two images. Then you can compute the camera motion between the two photos. The camera motion usually is parameterized by a rotation and a translation. With this camera motion, you can work on the 3D location of these features by translation. More cameras can be brought in to improve the result. And the modern method can scale up to work with thousand and even hundred of thousand photos. This is truly amazing. However, the output of such computer vision system is, always, is, is often noisy and uh, sparse. And in contrast, computer graphic application needs very clean data. It needs razor sharp details. So oftentimes, people, human have to step in and clean the result. And uh, sometimes, we, 
you might need to handcraft from scratch. So every time you hear the word handcraft nowadays, uh, it's a strong signal for machine learning to step in and automate the process. So in the rest of the lecture, I'm going to talk about how neural networks can be used as a sub-module and end-to-end -end pipeline for uh, forward rendering. And also I'm going to talk about how neural networks can be used as a differentiable renderer that opens the door for many interesting inverse applications. But let's first start from the forward uh, rendering process. Uh, as we mentioned before, Monte Carlo sampling is very expensive. And this is an example. On the top left, uh, we have the noisy rendering with one sample rate per pixel. And then the number of samples doubles from left to right and from top to bottom. As you can see, the result also improves. But at the same time, the comp computational cost also improves, uh, also increases. And I'm going to make a very fascinating analogy here. Most of you should be familiar with uh, AlphaGo by now, which uses uh, a policy network and a value network to speed up the multi color tree search. Um, for those who skipped some of the previous lectures, um, a value, uh, the value network um, takes the input board position and predicts a scalar value as the probability, uh, the winning probability. In essence, it reduces the depth of the tree search. Um, similarly, um, the policy network takes the board position as input and output a probability distribution for the best next move. In essence, it reduces the breadth of the search. So the analogy I'm trying to make here is we can also use a policy network and a value network to speed up the Monte Carlo sampling for rendering. For example, we can use a value network to denoise the uh, rendering with low sample per pixel. Basically, it tries to predict the correct pixel value from some noisy input. As far as policy network goes, we can use a network to generate a useful policy that smartly samples the race so the whole rendering converges faster. Let's first take a look at the value-based approach. This is a recent work we did for denoisy multicolor rendering. On the left, we have a noisy input image sampled at four, pix uh, four samples per, per pixel. In the middle is a denoisy result. On the right is the ground truth reference image rendered with a 32K sample per pixel. It takes about 19 minutes to do on a 12 core CPU. In contrast, the denoisy result only takes about a second to run on a commodity GPU. So there's a very good trade-off between speed and quality. The whole network is trade trade end-to-end -end as an autoencoder with two nodes. The first loss is the L1 loss of the VGG feature of the output image. The second loss is the GAN loss. The GAN loss here is obviously trying to retain the details in the output image. So this is a side-by-side -side comparison between the result of trained with and without the GAN loss. Denoising uh, natural images has been studied for a long time, but denoising multicolor rendering has some very unique point. The first thing is we can separate the diffuse and the specular components and run them through different paths of network, and then um, merge the result together. And this tends to improve the result a lot. Secondarily, uh, there are some very inexpensive byproduct of the rendering pipeline that we can use to further improve the result, such as the Abedo map, normal map, and depth. This um, byproduct can be used as a auxiliary feature that generates a context where the denoise should be conditioned on. However, how to fit this uh, auxiliary feature into the pipeline is still pretty much an open research question. The way we did in this paper is uh, something called animal-wise biosing and scaling. The animal-wise biosing takes the auxiliary features and run them through a bunch of convolution layers and uh, add the result into the input feature X animal-wisely. One can prove this is equivalent to feature concatenation. Animal-wise scaling um, runs animal-wise multiplication between the auxiliary features and the input feature X. The argument to have both scaling and biosing here is they capture different aspects of the relationship between two inputs. You can think animal-wise biosing is sort of an all operator which checks if a feature is in any one of these two inputs. In contrast, animal-wise scaling um, 
it's an end operator which checks whether the feature, in, the fe feature is in both of these two inputs. So by combining them together, um, the auxiliary feature can be utilized in a better way. And this is a denoise result um, taking a noisy input sample data at the four um, range per pixel. And then we compare our result with alternative method. In general, our method has less noise, noise, has less noise and more details. Now let's move on to the policy-based approach. Uh, I'm not going to cover the entire literature here, but I just want to point, point you to a, a very recent work from Disney Research, which is called the Neural Impotence Sampling. So the idea is we want to find for each location in the scene a very good policy that can help us to sample rates smartly and uh, reduce the convergence time. And in practice, the best possible policy is actually the instant radius map at that point, because it literally tells you where the lights come from. So the question is, can we generate this instant radius map from some local surface property through a neural network? And the answer is yes. Just like how we can, how we can nowadays generate images from random input noise, we can also train a generative network that generates this instant radius map from some local surface property, such as location, the, um, the direction of the incoming ray and then the surface normal. However, the catch is such mapping from the surface local property to the instant radius map varies from scene to scene, so the learning has to be carried online during the rendering process, meaning the network starts from generating some random policies and gradually learns the scene structure so it's able to produce better policies. And this is the result. On the left is the conventional ray tracing. On the right is the ray tracing with neural input sampling, which converge much faster, as you can see here. Okay. So far, we have been talking about how neural networks can be used as a sub-module for forward rendering. The next, I'm going to talk about how we can use neural networks as an end-to-end -end pipeline. Remember, we talked about ray tracing, which start from um, casting rays from the pixel to the 3D scene. This is so-called a image-centric approach. approach. Um, it's actually, this approach is kind of very difficult for neural networks to learn because, first of all, it's recursive. Second, second directly, um, you need to sample, you need to do discrete sample, which is very difficult to do analytically. And um, in contrast, there's another way of doing rendering, which is called a restoration, uh, which, is called, which is object centric. What it does is, for every 3D point, you can kind of shoot in rays towards the image. And it only needs to shoot one primary ray, so there's no recursion. And then you do not need to do any sampling. So this turns out to be very, this turns out to be easier for the neural network to learn. And the rasterization um, contains two main steps. The first step is for every 3D um, primitives, you kind of project the um, primitives to the 2D image plane and then impose them onto each other based on their distance to the image. So in this way, the frontmost surface can always be visible in the final rendering. The next step is to compute the shading. Um, basically, it ca calculates the pixel color by interpolating the color of the 3D primitives, such as the vertex color. In general, rasterization is faster than ray tracing. And as we mentioned before, uh, it's easier for neural networks to learn because it does not have a recursion or a discrete sampling process. All sounds great. Apart from, there's an, another catch, which is the input data format. Here are some uh, major mainstream 3D format. Uh, depth map, voxels, 3D point colors, and mesh, and some of them are not very friendly to neural networks. And my um, policy network tells me I should avoid them in this lecture. So anyway, let's start from the depth map. This is probably the easiest one, because all you need to do literally is to change the number of input channels from the first layer. Then you can run your favorite neural networks with it. And uh, it's also very memory efficient because nowadays the accelerators are designed to run images. 
Uh, another reason for depth map to be convenient to use is you do not need to cal calculate the visibility because every information in the depth map is already from the frontmost surface. All you need to do is to compute the shading. And there are many works um, in rendering depth map into images or the other way around, and I'm not going to talk about them in this lecture. So let's move on to Voxel. Voxel is also kind of friendly to neural networks because all the data are arranged in a grid structure. However, Voxel is very memory intensive. It's actually one order of magnitude higher um, than image data. So conventional neural networks can only run voxels of very low re resolution. But what makes voxel very interesting to us is it needs to compute both visibility and the shading. So this is a very good opportunity for us to learn an end-to-end -end pipeline um, for, for neural rendering. So we try this end-to-end -end neural voxel rendering called the render night. Um, it starts from transforming the input voxel into a camera correlate. I'd like to quickly emphasize here that such a 3D rigid body transformation is something we actually do not want the network to learn because uh, it's very easy to do with coordinated transformation, but very hard for convolution such operation to, to, to perform. And we will come back to this later. Having, having transformed the input voxel into a camera frame, the next step is to um, learn a neural voxel representation of the 3D shape. What we can do here is, is to pass the input voxel through a sequence of 3D convolution. Then the output neural voxel contains deep features that is going to be used for computing the shading and the visibility. The next step is to compute the visibility. One might be attempted to basically say, okay, we can use the standard um, depth buffer algorithm here. But it turns out this is not so easy because uh, when you do this 3D convolution, you kind of distribute diffuse the value within the entire voxel grid. So it's not clear that, that which grids are from the frontmost surface. At the same time, uh, since every voxel contains deep features, now you have to integrate uh, along, across all these channels to compute the visibility. To deal with this problem, we use something called a projection unit. This projection unit first take the 4D input tensor, which is this neural voxel, and reshape it into a 3D tensor by squeezing the last two dimensions. The last two dimensions are the depth dimension and the feature channel dimension. Then it learns a multi-layer perception, which um, learns to compute the visibility from um, along the squeezed last channel. So on a higher level, you can think this multi-level perception is a uh, inception network that learns to integrate visibility along the both steps and the features. The last step is to use a sequence of 2D up convolution to render the projected neural voxel into a, into a, pic, into a picture. And then we train this network end to end with a mean square error pixel loss. Here are some results. The first row is the input voxels. The second row is the output of the new render net. As you can see, RenderNet is able to learn to how to do the computation of visibility and the shading. You can also learn RenderNet to generate a different rendering effect, such as contour map, tone shading, and ambient occlusion. In terms of generalization performance, uh, we can use the RenderNet trade on chair model to render some unseen object, such as the bunny and the scene with multiple, ob uh, a scene with multiple objects. It can also handle data with corruption and the low resolution. The first row renders an input shape that is randomly corrupted. The second row renders an input shape that is, um, has a resolution that is 50% lower than the training resolution. The render network can also be used to render texture models. In this case, we learn an additional texture network that encodes input texture into a neural texture voxels. And these neural natural texture voxels will be concatenated with the input shape voxel in a channel-wise way. And a concatenated voxel is going to be fed into the network to render. 
And these are some result of random texture models. The first row is the input voxel. The second row is the ground truth reference image. The third row is our result from random net. As you can see, that the ground truth image is obviously has more sharper details. But in general, the random net is able to capture the major facial features and the computer visibility and the shading correctly. As a fine experiment, uh, we try to mix and match the shape and the texture. In this example, in the first row, uh, the image are rendered with the same shape input voxel and a different texture voxel. The second row render is rendered with the same texture but different shapes. Okay, now let's move on to a 3D point cloud. 3D point cloud is actually not so friendly to neural networks. Um, first of all, the data is not ranged, arranged on a grid structure. Um, in the meantime, depends on how you sample points from the surface, um, the number of points and the uh, order of the points can also vary. I just want to quickly point out this recent work called Neural Point Based Graphics from, uh, I think it's Samsung AI Lab. But before we talk about that, let's first talk about how conventional uh, rasterization is done for 3D point clouds. Basically, for every point in the 3D scene, we project the point into the image as a square. And the size of the square is kind of inversely proportional to the, dist uh, to the distance of the point to the image. Obviously, you have to impose the projected square on top of each other based on depth too. Next, what you do is you try to uh, color the squares using the RGB color of the 3D points. However, if you do this, um, there's a lot of holes in the result. In the same time, uh, you can see a lot of color blobs. So what this neural point-based graphics did is they replaced the RGB color by a learned neural descriptor. This neural descriptor is sort of an eight-dimensional vector that is associated with each input point. Uh, you can think about it's a deep feature that compensates the sparsity of the point cloud. This is a visualization of the neural descriptor using the first three PCA components. Um, we start by randomly initializing these neural descriptors for each point in the scene and optimize for that particular scene. Obviously, you cannot use the descriptor of one scene to describe another scene, so this optimization has to be done both in the training and the testing stage for, every, for each scene. And then the authors use an uh, autoencoder to encode the projected neural descriptor into, uh, into a photorealistic imaging. This render network is jointly trained with the optimization of the neural descriptor during the training, but uh, can be reused in the testing stage. These are some results which I think is really amazing. The first row is the rendering with conventional RGB uh, descriptor. The second row is the rendering with the neural descriptor. As you can see, uh, there's no hole and uh, the result is in general much sharper. And the very cool thing about this method is the neural descriptor is trained to be view invariant, meaning once they are optimized for a scene, you can uh, render the scene from different angles. That's really cool. Okay, last we have these uh, mesh models, which, which is difficult for neural networks because of its graphical re representation. I just want to quickly point out these two papers. Um, the first one is called Deferred Neural Rendering. It actually uses a very similar idea as we just talked about, uh, which is in this uh, neural, sorry, this neural point-based graphics. They use very similar ideas, but this paper applies the idea to render uh, mesh models. Another paper is neural 3D mesh render. It is cool in a way that you can even do 3D step transfer. However, the neural network part of this method uh, is used mainly to um, change the vertex color and the lo uh, and position. It's not so much into the rendering part but I just put this uh, reference here for people who are interested. Okay, so far we have been talking about the forward rendering. Let's move on to the, re the inverse rendering. Recall 
the re inverse rendering is the problem that given some input image, we want to work on the 3D scene that was used to generate this image. The particular method I'm going to talk about today is called differentiable rendering. It works as, as follows. First, we start from a target image. Then we generate a, some kind of approximation of the 3D scene. This approximation does not to be very good. As far as we can render it, we can compare the result with the target image. And then we can define some um, metric to measure the different, quantitatively measure the difference between the render image and the target image. And if the rendering process is differentiable, we can back propagate the loss to update the input model. And if we iteratively do this, eventually the hope is the input model will converge to something meaningful. And the key point here is the forward rendering process has to be differentiable in order to calculate this backpropagate back, back uh, operation. And this is where we immediately see the value of neural networks because modern neural networks are designed to be differentiable, designed to perform this backpropagation. So we got the gradient for free. Another reason for neural network to be helpful here is, as you can imagine, uh, this iterative optimization process is going to be very expensive. So what we can do with neural network is to learn a feed-forward process that approximates this iterative optimization. For example, we can learn an autoencoder which encodes the input image into some sort of a latent representation that enables some really interesting downstream tasks, such as novel view synthesis. However, in order to let the encoder to learn the useful representation, uh, we need to use the correct inductive bias. And the one in inductive bias I'm very interested in, very excited about it, is um, like that the learning can be a lot easier if you can separate the pose from the appearance. And I truly believe this is something human do. This is my four-year-old son playing shape puzzle. The task is to build a complex shape using some basic uh, shape primitive, such as triangle and square. In order to do this task, he has to apply 3D rigid body transformation to these primitive shapes in order to match what is required on the board. It's amazing that human can do this work rather effortlessly, while this is something the neural network was invented to suffer with. For example, the 2D convolution or the general the convolution is a local operation, which there's no way they can carry this global transformation. Fully connected layers might be able to do this, but at the cost of network capacity, because it has to memorize all the different configurations of the same object. So we asked the question, how about we just use simple coordinated transformation to encode the pose of the object and separate the pose from the appearance whether that will make the learning easier. So we try this idea called Hologan, which, which learns a 3D representation of, from natural images without a 3D supervision. By without a 3D supervision, I mean there's no 3D data and there's no ground truth label from the pose of the object in the image during the, learning, during, during the training process. Everything is learned from purely from 2D unlabeled data. So the cool thing about this idea is the learning is driven by inductive bias as opposed to uh, supervision. Let's first take a look at how conventional generative, net, generative, generative network works. Um, conventional, for example, conventional generative networks, generative images use 2D convolutions uh, with very few assumption about the 3D world. For example, this conditional GAN uh, concatenate um, post vectors um, or apply feature-wise tra feature transformation to control the pose of the, uh, generated, the, the, uh, the pose of the object in the generated images. Unless ground truth label is used in the training process, the pose is going to be learned as a latent variable, which is hard to interpret. At the same time, using 2D convolution to generate a 3D motion uh, will generate artifact in the result. In contrast, Hologan generates a much better result by separating the pose from the motion. 
This is some random faces generated by Hologram. And I'd like to emphasize there's no 3D data used in the training process. And the key point here is Hologram used a neural voxel as its latent representation. To learn such neural voxels, we use a 3D generator network. And the learned 3D voxel is going to be rendered by RandomNet, as we just talked about. The 3D generator is basically an extension of StarGAN into 3D. It has two inputs. The first one is a 4D tensor, a con learned, learned uh, 4D tensor, a constant tensor, which is learned um, as a sort of template of a particular class of object. And this, this tensor is going to, to run through a sequence of 3D convolution uh, to become the, the neural voxel re representation. The second input is this random vector used as a control, uh, used as a controller that will be first transformed into a fine parameter of the adaptive instant normalization layer through, all through the pipeline. Now, uh, generate the learned 3D voxel representation is going, as I said before, it's going to be rendered, rendered by RenderNet. And then in order to train this network in an unsupervised way, we, we use a uh, discriminant network to classify the uh, render image against real world image. The key here is it is crucially important that during the training process, we have to apply random rigid body transformation in the, uh, onto this uh, voxel representation. And this is actually how the inductive bias is injected during the learning process. Because in this way, the network is forced to learn some very strong representation that is unbreakable on the arbitrary pose. And in fact, if we do not apply random transformation during the uh, learning process, the network was not able to learn. These are some results. Um, as you can see, uh, Hologan is pretty robust to view transition and also uh, complex background. One limitation of Hologan is it can only learn posts that exist in the data set, in the training data set. Um, for example, in this car data set, uh, there's very little variation in the elevation direction, so the network cannot extrapolate. However, when there are enough training data, the network can surely learn. For example, we use ShapeNet to generate more poses for chairs, and the network is able to learn uh, to do 180 degree rotation in elevation. We also try a uh, network with some really challenging data set. For example, this bedroom data set. This data set is very challenging due to the fact that there's a very strong appearance variation across the data set. You can hardly find two bedrooms that looks like each other from different views. In this sense, there's a very weak post signal in the data set. However, the network is still able to generate something reasonable, and I think that's really interesting. Another surprise is the network is able to further decompose the appearance into shape and the texture. As a test, we fit two different control vectors one to the 3D part of the network, the other to the 2D part of the network. And it turns out the 3D controller, the, the, the controller fit into the 3D part of the network controls the shape, and the controller fit into the 2D part of the network controls the texture. So these are some results. Every row in this image using the same texture controller but a different shape controller. Every column in this image using the same shape controller but a different controller. I think this is truly amazing because it always reminds me about the a uh, vertex shader and a fragment shader in a conventional computer graphics pipeline, where the vertex shader changes the geometry and the conventional shader doing the coloring. Okay, I think it's probably a good time to start to draw conclusions. At the beginning of this talk, uh, we asked the question, uh, can neural network be helpful to forward rendering and inverse rendering? And I think the answer is yes. We have seen neural networks been used as a sub module to speed up ray tracing. And then we have seen example of the value-based approach and the policy-based approach. We also have seen neural network 
being used as an end-to-end system that helps 3D clusterization. And as, as far as the inverse problem goes, we see neural network can be used as a very powerful differential, differentiable renderer that opens the door to many um, um, interest downstream applications such as view synthesis. And the key thing here is neural network is able to use the correct interactive bios to learn a strong representation. And before I finish the talk, I just want to say this is pretty much still an um, opening question, a very new research frontier. There's a lot of opportunities. For example, there's, there's still a huge gap between the quality of the end-to-end -end rendering and the conventional physical-based rendering. And as far as I know, there's really no good solution for neural-based mesh renderer. And in terms of the inverse problem, we have seen encouraging results of learning strong representation. However, it's interesting to see what uh, more effective inductive bios and the uh, network architecture can be used to push learning forward. And I, before I end the talk, I'd like to thank my colleague and uh, collaborators who did an amazing job on these papers, especially Chu, who did the most work for RenderGAN and HoloGAN, uh, sorry, RenderNet and HoloGAN, and also Bing, who did the most work for the um, neural Monte Carlo denoising. Okay. With that, I finish my talk. Thank you. Thank you.